And um, what we're now going to do, and thank you very much to, to, our, to our presenters, is uh, launch the white paper uh, that uh, Alison mentioned this morning in our plenary launch. Um, and what I want to do over the next sort of 10, 10 or 15 minutes is just sort of talk you through the, the process that we, we've gone through to do just that. So we're launching this document. It's called Putting People First, Commissioning for Connected uh, Care, Homes and Communities. And um, what I want to do is to sort of set out some of the things that we've done as part of uh, putting this white paper together over the last, last month. Uh, and it's been inspired by some of the contributions that we've had from speakers today and some of the engagements we've had with other commissioners of uh, healthcare and commissioners of social care who have really begun to think about a different way to commission for these services. And I thought Rob Webster and his comments about how the future is here, it's just not terribly evenly distributed, really speaks to what we've found through this work, that there are places that are well ahead of the curve, and we now need to make sure that what they are doing is much better understood and more widely shared. So this really is what the white paper is all about, and I think it under, underscores some of the points that Molly Watts made to us all this morning when she uh, spoke to us, that this is fundamentally about people having uh, and being able to live the lives they want to lead, feeling safe, being able to be independent for as long as possible, and having the confidence to actually enjoy their lives uh, as best they can. So technology is seen as the enabler to that, rather than something that is in the foreground, absolutely dominating things, and really underscoring the point about outcomes that we, we heard about just now. So, um, we had this think tank, we, we held it in uh, September of this year. We brought together a, a range of expertise from academia, from the commissioning communities in the NHS and in social care across England, uh, some housing providers, some other social care providers, representation from the home care sector and so on. So a diverse range of expertise and opinion that we wanted to uh, engage in a conversation about how we do this differently in order to really embed technology as part of a, a transformation. And that work has led to the publication of this report uh, that we're launching today. Uh, and really at the heart of that is the idea that, uh, that, that how do you construct a case for change? How do you define what good looks like? How do you define what the key enablers are in the conversations you as industry uh, leaders may want to be having with local authorities, with the NHS? How do uh, you commission on outcomes and not simply default back to trying to define it in terms of inputs and outputs. And those are the things that we covered off and worked through during this session. So the first thing that uh, we concluded from all of this work was that um, we have to, re have to move away from the traditional business as usual. Just doing the same thing time and time again, as Albert Einstein said, really is the definition of insanity. Uh, and yet too often that is what happens, people default back to what they are comfortable with and uh, stick to it, but expect triumph of hope over expectation, perhaps. Um, so that's the first thing that we conclude. We have to have a different model which makes a new business as usual for those social workers we were hearing about in Hampshire who see it now as business as usual to be prescribing as part of their work access to the right sorts of technology that will enable people to fulfill the outcomes that they've agreed through their care planning. Secondly, and we've heard this, I think, very powerfully articulated just now in the presentation, you need robust, real-time benefits realisation to be wrapped around this, because you're not going to persuade, as industry, commissioners to take the risks that they will be taking about buying into new forms of contracting and, indeed, new, new service models, unless they are able to convince their finance directors that not only does this avoid cost, but also it can help reduce cost as well. So robust benefits realisation is a key part of what this white paper talks about. We also uh, were told time and time again by all the different voices in the room during this think tank about the importance of making sure that there was both good clinical leadership when it comes to landing successfully uh, innovation within an NHS context, good practitioner engagement more generally, and absolutely centrally, the involvement of service users, patients and carers in service redesign. If they are, if they are not there supporting and driving this, then you are going to be lost right from the outset. 
And there was a really important message that came across again, was the value of partnering across the system. Now, Rob was talking about the sustainability and transformation plans. We heard about those earlier today. The importance of actually collaborating across different organisations to share expertise is really important. We heard, for example, in Liverpool, where the CCG has been driving a lot of digital innovation into service uh, delivery, they uh, worked with Staffordshire County Council around their business analytics needs to be able to support the transformations that they wanted to put in place. So identifying where the skills and capabilities are uh, and, and bringing them to the fore through partnering across the system, not necessarily in a formal contracting way, uh, although it may well be that. And we also identified the need for digital leadership skills. And let me be absolutely clear what this is not. This is not about sending people off to some new academy to learn all about technology. This is about good business service redesign and understanding data, doing data analytics, doing service process uh, planning, and actually working through how you go about the process of looking at an existing service and working out how you might reconceive and redesign that. So it's a very different set of skills that we're talking about here. It's about mapping processes, it's about how you engage with those service users and carers, and those skill sets are often in short supply. It's why, again, the point about uh, working across systems is so important. I think we heard this point both from NHS colleagues at the think tank and uh, very much from local authority colleagues, the importance of taking ag an agnostic approach to the technology, of not being dazzled by it and perhaps seeing something that is far more than actually is possible. So being realistic in that sense was uh, very much a stress. So being optimistic but realistic and open-minded but challenging uh, and not being dazzled by the technology. And again, placing the service user and the care at the heart of the conversation and the heart of the, the process of rethinking how services might uh, be developed. And we heard a lot uh, in the presentation just now about risk. And one of the things that came across very clearly was the need for new forms of contracting to enable us to properly share risk and reward in the system. That if we don't have that, then we won't get the investment coming from, uh, from industry, uh, the risk taking that needs to be made there, and we won't get local authorities being prepared to take these sorts of innovative approaches as well. So innovative contracting requires new approaches to sharing risks and rewards. And we also have to be realistic about pace and the, scale, the, 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 the pace at which things can actually be delivered. And I sometimes think that the one thing that might be questionable about the five-year forward view is the number five, and that the number five in this case will not add up to the transformation and sustainability goals, the laudable closing of the gap that Rob was talking about earlier on. And that may well lead to the uh, disappointment that this equation suggests. So understanding that and having that patience and that timeline that is realistic is really important in terms of landing real transformation and real service uh, benefits from the point of view of uh, service users. And we also think it's really important to get across this important message about buddying up for mutual benefit, working across to share expertise and capabilities, being an absolutely key part of making sure that this uh, lands well, and hopefully this particular group in this uh, shot landed well as well. And we heard from this morning from George Crooks talking about the need to take a whole population approach. Well, that again is relevant here. And one of the things we heard, particularly when it comes to local authority procurement of these sorts of arrangements to social services, is the importance of thinking not just about that part of the population who will have eligible needs for funded, state-funded social care, but the wider population who have those needs, but we're paying for them themselves. And creating opportunities for market growth uh, through the self-funder market is really important here as well. So thinking about the whole population uh, is really key as well. We've heard about evidence, and what we're saying here is that need to keep fresh, up to date with what the evidence is showing as being a key component in good service redesign and keeping the service uh, really up to scratch. So those are some of the main findings that came out of our discussion. So what is the TSA going to take away from all of that? What are we going to do next? Well, in terms of our next steps, we are going to be raising awareness. We're going to be talking about this white paper in as many places as we can. We've got meetings coming up shortly with David Bian at the CQC. We'll be engaging with various colleagues at NHS England and working with them on the findings and uh, outcomes from this report. We'll also be 
starting to work out some key plans around how we collaborate with industry partners, with commissioner partners, to deliver some of the findings from this report, to actually support organisations to think and act differently in the way in which they go about their commissioning activities. And not by TSA just preaching at them, but actually by working with partners who are doing this on the ground, and who are actually living this, and that practical experience being really very important to this message. And we want to instill that sense of collaboration as being part of the way in which we, we get this to work and we get uh, the TSA message uh, from this to, to, uh, to be understood. And we also heard very loud and clear from the audience involved in this event that, they, that having just a one-off event was not sufficient from their point of view. That actually, in some cases, they feel quite isolated as local digital leaders working through these challenges of how you redesign services uh, on a burning platform with resources reducing and so on. And one of the things that TSA will be establishing is a local digital leaders network, again, to try and share that expertise, work with the industry, work with academia to pull the expertise that we have and then spread that more widely. And Alison, this morning, launched the quality framework. And I think it's really important that we understand what this quality framework, this new quality framework that TSA has been working on for the last year or so, does. It's a fundamental shift from a model that was all about counting outputs to one that is focused on outcomes. It fits absolutely with, with the direction of national policy. It is, I think, a great way of opening the door to conversations with commissioners, whether they be local government or NHS, who increasingly are going to have to think about how they commission for outcomes. So getting national approval from a variety of organisations is going to be a key part of how we uh, make sure that what is already a well-respected code becomes an even more widely adopted one in the future. And finally, and you'll hear more about this during the rest of this conference, We've been doing as an organisation a lot of work to map out the uh, digital future and identify some of the, the road humps and obstacles that may well be hitting us over the next uh, few years. And this itself is an important product that doesn't exist anywhere else in the industry. And we want to be using that also as part of how we get the conversations at the right level to get this message across. And finally, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to the people who gave up their time for this event. We had a wide range of organisations involved around the table. We weren't, we weren't able to have everyone we would have liked to have involved around the table, which is why we're going to establish this local digital leaders network. But the key message from all of this is that simply bolting technology on, being dazzled by the kit, is not the right way forward. It will not, in the end, be a credible way to make progress. It has to be about how we redesign services, how as an industry we support commissioners in their ambitions to redesign services, and in some case bring the expertise that enables them to do that because they lack it for themselves. And that really is the message that comes out of this, and at the heart of it, in the end, it all turns on how we make sure people like Molly Watts and others have the lives they want and therefore it's about putting people first. So that's what we're launching today. Please do check it out. It will be on the website, so you can download it uh, and share it with as many people as you possibly can, because I think it will have some very important messages that will support uh, you in your work at a local level. Thank you very much.